The Western Interior Seaway, an inland sea full of deadly reptiles and fish. From sharks, plesiosaurs, and mosasaurs, the massive stretch of water contains all forms of monsters. Though much of the daily carnage that ensues is relatively close to the surface, deeper down, things are just as chaotic. Every night an assortment of life forms rise up from the depths to feed on algae and the like. In turn, their predators follow. This goes up the food chain until some of the fastest residents of the ocean appear looking for prey. Squids. These small, swift, and dazzling cephalopods appear in their thousands to hunt together, though in a feeding frenzy, they can sometimes attack and eat each other. But squid are not at the top of the food chain, even in these dark waters. Flying through the water on four wing-like flippers, with a neck almost as long as its body and tail combined, comes a group of Styxosaurus. These huge plesiosaurs are 11 meters long, but despite their size, aren't that dangerous to other large marine reptiles. Their long necks contain over 60 vertebrae, holding a proportionally small head. Armed with conical interlocking teeth, these weapons make it impossible for Styxosaurus to swallow large prey, or even tear flesh apart effectively, but what they are good for is piercing and holding on to slippery prey, such as the squid the group are swimming towards. A steady diet of small ocean food has led many plesiosaurs to grow to large sizes, and part of that is thanks to their long necks. Their long range and quick movements give them a fighting chance to snag fast fish in their jaws. This hunt is different, however. The swarms of squids are busy ferociously hunting down their prey in such numbers that they almost seem like a constantly moving wall amongst the depths. The Styxosaurus do not attempt to chase the writhing mass. Instead, they casually glide towards their targets, slowing down so they swim alongside this wall. The lead Styxosaurus starts off first by moving his head sideways and taking a bite out of the mass of squid. The invertebrates don't see him coming till it is too late, and the large reptile grabs a mouthful of them before the ones close to his skull dart back, making it look like the Styxosaurus literally took a bite out of the wall. Others join in, each one swinging their heads to the side and catching their prey up to six at a time. The squid know the marine reptiles are there, but they can't track the movement of their heads in the dark water till it is too late and are also too busy feeding on their own prey to fully concentrate on the Styxosaurus. There are so many squid on offer here, and they are so easy to catch, that the Styxosaurus often drop many of the ones they catch, and don't bother trying to scoop them back up. They swallow them, and then strike back into the wall of squid, and it is rare that they don't catch at least one. If this type of hunting is so easy, why don't the Styxosaurus do it all the time? For one, it's never clear where the squid will rise each night, and can sometimes be a matter of luck if a group finds a school of them. The other is that the squid don't have all the nutrients that the Styxosaurus need in their diet, so they have to hunt fish regularly in order to live healthily. For the Styxosaurus, this is the equivalent of fast food. At this depth, vision is compromised, but the Styxosaurus can still detect changes in the water, and after swallowing down his latest catch, one male detects something very large heading their way. The shoal of squid bursts apart and a huge set of jaws slam shut, almost taking the head of one of the Styxosaurus. Looking across, the male sees that another marine reptile has joined the fray, but this one is nothing like the long-necked plesiosaurs. Their attacker is a mosasaur, Tylosaurus, just as long as the Styxosaurus, but much heavier, and built to hunt other large marine reptiles. The hunter tastes the water with its forked tongue, and arches back around for a follow-up attack, now no longer obscured by the mass of squids. The Styxosaurus begin to dive deeper. They have no defense against the Tylosaurus. All they can do is keep as far away from him as possible. The male that first spotted the large Mosasaur was higher than the others, and so he was an obvious choice for the huge predator. The enormous carnivore aimed for the long neck reptile, and accelerated forward with incredible speed, aiming to bite down on the Styxosaurus' completely exposed neck. The male had to time this exactly right, 
and he kept one eye on the shrouded figure of the Tylosaurus as it got closer and closer. The hunter opened its jaws aiming to behead its target, but right before he closed his jaws, the Styxosaurus spun his head around, creating a loop as he rested his head on the base of his own neck. At the same time he drove backwards with his flippers, almost coming to a stop. The Tylosaurus' jaws slammed shut just missing the Styxosaurus, and sailing forward through the water. By the time the mighty carnivore spun around, the plesiosaur had unraveled its neck and descended deeper into the sea. Having used up a lot of oxygen in two failed attempts at predation, the Tylosaurus retreated to the surface for air. The Styxosaurus regrouped and swam away from their attacker, staying deep in the water till they felt safe enough so they themselves could return to the surface and take a well-deserved breath. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the ocean's long-necked residents, Styxosaurus. The holotype of Styxosaurus was found in Logan City, Kansas in 1890, and though it was thought to be a species of elasmosaur, in 1943 Samuel Paul Wells found it to be its own genus, naming it Styxosaurus snow eye, after the mythological river Styx, a river in Greek mythology that separated the living world from the underworld. Another more complete skeleton would be found in 1945 in South Dakota, which would get its own species name, Styxosaurus brown eye, and in 2023, Elliot Smith and Robert O'Keefe assigned another specimen that was thought to be a phalasmodon to a new species of Styxosaurus, calling it Styxosaurus rizaki. Styxosaurus lived in North America during the late Cretaceous between 83 and 72 million years ago, in the vast inland sea that covered much of the North American continent at the time, known as the Western Interior Seaway. It was a plesiosaur in the Elasmosauridae family, a family known for their extremely long necks even for plesiosaurs. It grew to lengths of 11 to 12 meters, with the neck being 5.25 meters all on its own. Weight is harder to calculate, with 4 tons being the best estimate that I could find. The holotype was a skull and multiple vertebra, which were preserved in exquisite condition. This was in fact the first intact skull of an elasmosaurid ever found, it measured 42 centimeters long, with the mandible measuring 48 centimeters long. Most striking about the skull are the long conical interlocking teeth, which would have been perfect for snapping up fish and other slippery marine prey, and ensuring they had no way of escape. If you look closely, you'll see that the prominent midline crest extends along the top of the snout to form a boss between the external nasal opening and the orbits, which with later discoveries would prove to be a trait seen in other elasmosaurids. This was clearly an animal designed to snare and swallow quick prey, but the size of its skull and its inability to chew meant that Styxosaurus was likely restricted to small prey, such as fish, squid, and belemites. Now we come to that mighty neck, which contained up to 75 vertebra. When it comes to flexibility, plesiosaurs in general may have not had a great range of motion when it came to craning their necks up or down, and probably couldn't curl them up snake-like, as they are sometimes depicted as doing. Sideways, however, they had a much greater range of motion. For elasmosaurids especially, it is believed that they could curl around their necks enough that they could rest their heads on top of their own neck. So what was the point of evolving these long necks? Catching prey is the most obvious conclusion, but the way in which they did so is not fully understood. One theory is that plesiosaurs would approach fish from beneath so that they could use the murk of the water to quote, hide their bodies while they presented a small profile of the front of their heads to the prey, effectively distracting the fish with their large bodies so that they were less likely to see their small heads up front, and then come up and grab them. Another theory is that they would swim close to a school of fish, and then by lunging at them with their jaws, they would corral the fish in a way to swim towards their bodies, forcing them to either slow or swim around them, giving them that extra second to snap up a meal that they wouldn't have if they simply attacked them in open water. 
Still, the exact methods that they used are up for debate, and we simply have nothing quite like Styxosaurus living today that we could compare it to. As always, when it comes to these seemingly overly large body parts, we shouldn't ignore that they may have been used for display. The large neck could have had display structures, or been capable of displaying different colours either to warn off rivals or signal to potential mates, but this is of course mostly theory. Styxosaurus remains have been found with stones in their stomach contents. These are referred to as gastroliths, and have been found in other plesiosaurs and has been assumed to have acted as a ballast, counteracting the air in the animal's lungs, allowing it to stay submerged more easily. However, the Styxosaurus remains also contained fish bones that have been grounded up in the stomach, giving rise to a new theory that they swallowed these stones to aid in digestion. As they weren't able to chew food, they would have to swallow small stones that would grind down tough parts like scales, teeth, and bones, quickening the digestive process. In addition, the weight of the stones would have had very little impact on any animal the size of Styxosaurus, and any effect in weighing down the animal would have been minimal, and likely a secondary effect to the digestion theory. But it's also thought that Styxosaurus stored a lot of fat at the base of its tail like modern crocodilians and some lizards do, leaving the rest of the body more streamlined, and not getting in the way of its four paddle-like flippers. So, Styxosaurus, a great example of the sheer size the plesiosaurs were able to get to despite the seemingly limited physical structures they were working with. In a way, it's sort of taking the plesiosaur body plan to its most extreme, just keep adding more vertebra and make the longest neck possible. One would think that having such a vulnerable area like the neck become so large would be an easily exploitable weak spot for predators, but this family ruled the oceans for the majority of the Mesozoic, and would have likely continued to do so if not for the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous. But what do you think of Styxosaurus? And for my question of the week, how vulnerable do you think Styxosaurus was to large predators like Tylosaurus and Cretoxyrhina? Or do you believe its size was enough to dissuade most predators? Well, as a known marine reptile, would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.